the Pali word we translate as perception or mental label, sanya, has another meaning as well. It's an agreement. In part, it's an agreement between one part of the mind and the other. This is how the mind communicates with itself, how it makes notes. It's going to interpret this particular experience in this particular way. And there's an agreement. And we pick up this pattern of inner dialogue from our outside dialogues. Language is a set of agreements. We all agree to speak the same language. And we, when we say things, we agree to the common meanings. And there's a general agreement about the language as a whole, English all across America. But there are also specific agreements among special certain groups of friends. Words, phrases will have one meaning in one group of friends and another meaning in another one. And many times you find that when you're sitting here, even though you may be sitting here all alone, not talking to anybody, you're carrying the meanings of your friends in your head, the agreements you had among your friends. And this can be not only recent friends, but also friends and family would go way back. This is one of the reasons why, on the one hand, you should be very careful about choosing your friends. Because a lot of these agreements are unstated. They're implied. And there are a lot of unsaid assumptions in those implications. So you have to be careful about what assumptions you're picking up from them and whose assumptions you're picking up. And this is also why, as you meditate, you should learn how to test your perceptions. You find that you have your own internal language for things. Well, learn how to question it. The way you label the breath, the way you label states of mind that you get into. The way you label what's important and what's not important to pay attention to. These are all major issues in the meditation. Remember when I was studying with the John Fung, things would happen in my meditation that I'd get all excited about. This must mean this, this must mean that. I'd go and report it to him. He seemed not the least bit interested. And other times I'd come across something that didn't strike me as very important. He would fasten on that. And it turned out, of course, that those were the things things that he would fasten on were the ones that actually made a big difference in the meditation. So you have to be careful about your assumptions as you're coming in to meditate. and be willing to relearn your ideas about what's important in the meditation and what's not. And look at the assumptions underlying your internal agreements. One of the big assumptions is the question of how things happen in the meditation. A really popular assumption is that you sit here and wait for something to happen. And if you're patient enough, something will come along. But the assumption that the Buddha had was that 
These things come from causes, and they come from what you do. Some of the things will come from what you did in the past, about which you have no control. But a lot of things that are happening in the meditation come from what you're doing right now. And the way you label things is one of those. So you want to be careful about how you label things. Take, for instance, your sense of the body right here now. Buried deep down inside, and a lot of us is the idea where we're sitting here with a solid body that has liquid coursing through it, and then the breath comes in and out certain parts. But our primary experience of the body is the solid part. Try turning that around. Think of your basic experience of the whole body is breath. Either in and out breathing or the, the breath flowing through the blood vessels, through the nerves. Because without that breath you wouldn't sense the body at all, you'd be dead. So learn to look at your sensation of the body as a set of variations on the breath energy. And then work with that perception. If there's a blockage or a sense of tightness in the body, okay, it's a sign that the breath isn't isn't running right. Maybe you're trying to push it in a direction that it doesn't want to go. Or we'll try reversing your idea of how the breath should flow as you breathe in, how it should flow as you breathe out. And then there's that whole issue of pulling the breath in, pushing it out. Well, what's doing the pulling? What's doing the pushing? Well, that's breath energy, too. So you want to coordinate that with the other sensations that you've labeled breath. So that there's no fighting in the body. And when there's no fighting, then it's a lot easier to settle down and stay with the body. There's a sense of fullness that comes when it's not fighting. When each part of the body is allowed to be energized and it's not being pushed in order to energize something else. Each has its own right to be. Each part of the body has its own way of getting the breath energy without having to push it or pull it across something else. Try thinking of the breath in that way. It's like you've got this big sponge. All sorts of openings for the breath to come in and out. So there's no fighting, there's no, there's no quarreling in the body. That's one set of perceptions you can play with. Another is the whole issue of thoughts that come into the mind. When a thought comes in the mind, is a part of the mind that says, God, look into this, see what this is all about. Maybe there's entertainment, maybe there's something important. Learn to switch that perception around. Look at the thought as something that's simply bubbling up in the mind. And realize that if it has any meaning, it's the meaning you're giving to it. And if that's the case, why bother with it? Because you're the one that's going around giving meanings to things. They in and of themselves don't have much of a meaning. Again, you're, you're communicating with yourself and giving a little message from one part of the mind to another. The underlying assumption, you've got to look into every thought that comes into the mind. Well, you don't. Reprogram those messages. Learn to create new agreements inside the mind. That when a thought comes up, learn how to recognize the incipient symptoms, even before it's coagulated into something that you can clearly identify as a thought about this or a thought about that. There'll be a little stirring in the mind. 
Sometimes it seems to be on the border between what's physical and what's mental, just a little stirring. And keep it at that level, right on the borderline between physical and mental, and breathe through it as quickly as you can. And this will involve a lot of reordering of your basic assumptions, your basic priorities. The breath becomes more important. Your sense of stillness becomes more important, and the, the thoughts get pushed down to a lower level. Instead of being something to explore and take on as a new world, it becomes simply an event that you have to watch out for. When you can change your priorities like this, change your inner agreements like this, it has a big impact on the meditation. At the very least, you begin to see how many of these subconscious agreements, subconscious assumptions you've been carrying around. And when you realize you don't have to follow them, you don't have to carry them around, it becomes really liberating. So learn to question your assumptions, learn to question your perceptions, these little agreements in the mind. Who made the agreement? Who pushed it on you? And why are you willing to carry it around? One easy way to do this is to turn everything around. If your metal label says X, say, well, how about not X? Try something simple. There's a sensation in the front of the body, or at least it seems to be in the front of the body. You ask yourself, well, what if that sensation is actually related to the back of the body? How would you read it then? Or vice versa. When you learn how to see how arbitrary a lot of these agreements are, how arbitrary a lot of these perceptions are, then you're more free to learn how to figure out what is a skillful perception. What perceptions get the best results? Well, then stay with those perceptions. You have the choice. So much of our suffering comes from our belief that we don't have a choice. A particular sensation comes up, and we need to label it as, as a pain. When then it becomes a pain, it becomes this big thing. It becomes solid, and it grabs onto a certain part of the body. But look at the sensation of that, sensation of that pain. Which parts of the sensation are actually pain sensations? Which parts are body sensations? Which parts are breath sensations? Warmth? Coolness, solidity. And you begin to realize there are many levels in the same spot. But you don't have to glom them all together. And when you don't glom them all together, then you can focus on whatever level you want to. It's like tuning in your radio. Right now, all the airwaves going through this, through the room right now, going through your body right now. There's Rush Limbaugh in there. There's a San Diego classical music station. There's hard rock. There's all kinds of stuff. And you have the choice. You don't have to listen to Rush Limbaugh if you don't want to. Tune into something worthwhile. The same with the sensations in the body. There are sensations there that if you focus on them in a certain way and label them in a certain way, it's going to get you all worked up. But right next to them are other sensations that you can label in different ways. Learn how to take apart whatever sense of tension or tightness seems to be occupying a part of the body. See that there are other sensations right there in the same spot.
Make those your preoccupation. Label those and see what difference it makes. There's that old statement about how an unexamined life is not worth living. Well, an unexamined perception is not worth believing. Learn how to examine your perceptions. Try playing around with alternate ones and see how they have an impact on the mind. And then you can choose which ones you want at any particular time. This is why the Buddha was able to live in a body that went through the cycles of aging, illness, and death, but didn't have to suffer. Because he learned how to label it in a different way, learned how to perceive all these processes in a different way. came up with new agreements in the mind. So that's an important part of what we're doing right here. Seeing how different sensations trigger perceptions, but also realizing the perceptions can trigger sensations. And there's a potential for skill. And taking advantage of that fact. <laughs>